What's up, guys? Welcome back to the channel. Um, I'm excited to be here today with Doug. He writes a book that um, I picked up the first couple of books from it. It's called The Nefarious Smiths. It's kind of a, an inverse of uh, like the Fantastic Four or something. It's a an evil family, and uh, it's a really cool book. I heard about it on Cheers to Comics, and I know um, you have another project out right now, so I've heard him talking about that again. So I guess, why don't you introduce yourself and explain the Nefarious Smiths a little bit better? Um, yeah, for sure, man. Uh, my name is Doug. Like you said, I write the Smiths. Uh, basically, it's a book, and it's kind of like, instead of basically how everything's always about super vill or superheroes, sorry, we've just kind of spun that. And now we're going from the villain side of things and like exploring the the fact that, well, this villain's got a family too, and he's got wife and kids. And how do they agree with him running around doing all this mischief? And are they in on it? And just how it affects their daily lives and stuff. And it's basically like, we're going to try and take as many comic stories as we can and just flip them. It's like, usually you have Spider-Man swinging by and he beats the shit out of Doc Ock while he's robbing a bank. But in this case, we're going to be, well, here's right. Why the Smiths are robbing the bank or after they get the shit kicked out of them, they go home and complain like, Oh man, he really had to do that hard. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. It reminds me of like, um, uh, man, what is, is it DreamWorks that does the movie with, uh, Steve Carell? Oh yeah. Uh, with the minions and stuff. Yeah. 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 That's yeah, kind it of reminds me of something like that. Like it's like a fun, different perspective on all the other stuff that you usually get. You know, you always see it from the hero's perspective and this puts us in the shoes of the, the evil family, you know, and how they're affected by their dad's evil genius tendencies well yeah exactly like the the new issue they they just try to go on a vacation basically because of all the <laughs> shit they've been going through in the last few issues dealing with the cops and government and everybody hunting them down so this issue they just try and go on a vacation and it's like can you still do that once you're a villain and you're like in the top 10 most wanted so it doesn't really work out very well for them at the start so it's like i, I don't know it's kind of it's kind of like all the media and news is like, oh, these this family's here and they're dangerous and they who knows what they're up to and they're just like, we're just here trying to take a vacation because you guys are always trying to kill us. Like we're not up to anything. Like, you guys just keep spinning everything on us. And so it's sort of like, it looks at that aspect of like, once you're a villain to a certain point, there's no coming back and they just they just keep making stuff up. And so rather than try and like, fix their name or be like, we got to like redeem ourselves. This family's like, Oh, screw you guys. Like we're villains now. Like, yeah. <laughs> they <laughs> embrace the life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, <laughs> we're whatever you say we are. Like, <laughs> so it's, uh, Cause like normally when I read, like there's two ways you can do it. You could either have them just go like straight out evil, like the Joker, which I'm not really into, or you can have them try and redeem themselves. That seems to be the two, most logical one. So I'm trying to kind of go between those two where you don't go too insanely evil, but at the same time, you're like not going to worry about fixing things. It's like, let's just survive and get through life this way. Cause I yeah. haven't really seen anyone go that route yet. Yeah. But have it, have it, you been reading uh, the Joker from uh, James Tynan? Yeah, man. With uh, Gordon hunting him down. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what, uh, like this kind of, you know, the I think the one that comes out today, in fact, the cover is like the Joker, like at a resort, like oh, in yeah, he's on the pool. Yeah, he's <laughs> <in> the pool. <laughs> makes me think of like, uh, you know, the nefarious Smiths, like going on vacation. It, it never goes right. Well, yeah, it's, it's stressful being a villain, man. People are always trying to <laughs> hunt you, like, can't trust You're so pigeonholed, you know, very typecast. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Like oh. uh, in the Incredibles, you know, it seems like all the villains, like they're kind of forced into that lifestyle, you know, and so they show up and everybody's like, oh, yeah, you're the bad guy because we're the good guys, you know. Well, yeah, that's that's kind of what I want to do in the Smiths, too, is have them like come across other villains and a lot of them be like, they kind of did this one bad thing at one point and they were just never able to get past it. And so that's what a lot of them are going to be dealing with and stuff. Just be like, oh, careful, man, you're the bad guys now. Like you can't. You can't do all this stuff. Like they took all that from you. And just, oh no, I'm still gonna do it. And it's like, no, it doesn't work that way anymore, man. Like, really, sort of explore the 
how hard it is to come back from like redemption or and just mm-hmm. how yeah it's I don't know society is really weird now with like social media and cancel culture and just bringing stuff up and like so it's going to be really hard for a lot of these villains and just I don't know a lot of stuff I want to explore and and do it funny at the same time like it's a really yeah book so it's Oh, it's I want to have them shooting guns at the cops and just be holding their ears like I didn't realize they were so loud. <laughs> just things that you don't normally see in a, a cartoony book like this. Add yeah, realism, but in the I don't know, sort of. Yeah, it, yeah it's really it, cool. It's a cartoon world where a bullet can kill you, but you could still meet a unicorn or a vampire, and it makes sense. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's cool though. Like, because it kind of makes me think about, um, you know, like you said, like the the social media thing, the cancer cult, cancel culture thing, um, but also just like the idea of like celebrity and and being a public figure. You know, like everything you do is you know hit with this spotlight, and so you know what I guess to the point is like kind of like you lose anonymity. You're never going to be able to go away. Like once you've become known for something, you know yeah, exactly. No, the media almost like picks who you are <laughs> at a certain yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, based on what they have seen of you, but not all the struggles it took to get there, you know. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's cool. There's stuff like uh, you watch The Boys. I never actually read the comic, uh, but I watched the show. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't seen any of The Boys yet. I've seen a couple of the like previews, so I know kind of what it is. Um, but I do also hear a lot of people comparing that and Jupiter's legacy. And I've seen a couple of episodes of that so far. Oh, what did you think of that? Did you like it? Um, yeah, I really like it. I thought the first episode, like it really drew me in and like kind of set the tone and stuff. Uh, and, uh, then you get that big fight at the end of the final of the first episode. And then everything that happens in that second episode, just like really solidified how much I like that show. Cause it's been really cool. I've watched four episodes and yeah, I haven't been this far. Yeah, I'm really enjoying it as well. Uh, I'm yeah. glad that Netflix picked up Mark Miller. Uh, he's got a lot of stuff I'm, I'm looking forward to watching. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it feels like this is getting thing. treated way better than, like, um, Wanted or... Uh, yeah. Well, I feel like the Kingsman was pretty, like, yeah, Kingsman well was handled. Good. Yeah. But, you know, like, Wanted, I feel like that could have been, like, a giant movie. And uh, so, yeah. hopefully, Wanted this kind of shows us Netflix is taking a little yeah, bit better care of his properties. Yeah, they'd be a little more respectful. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think part of that too, I think his movies, like they just bought the property and made the movie. And I think Netflix is working with him yeah. on making these shows and stuff. So hopefully that's where that comes into play is like he's still, you know, in the pie or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully he's like, this is cheesy as fuck. Don't do that. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah. good. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I really enjoyed Jupiter's Legacy. They pull no punches with that. It's great. <laughs> I really like that they're asking that question about, like, well, the old code, is it still relevant today? Because that bothers me so much. Like, Batman and Joker, like, at this point, everyone Joker kills. It's on Batman. Like, I'm sorry, dude. Like, you've had so many <laughs> chances to do something about You don't have to kill him, but you could, like, break all his arms so they don't work anymore or cut his tongue out or do something. But, like. Yeah, this guy is nonstop killing tons of people, and that I don't know is his code still. And that's what's cool about yeah. his legacy is it's because it's asking that, and it's like, what if I, what happens when evil is just so evil that you have to do something? Like, when does yeah. wrong become right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like the way that um, I don't know to me to me it like kind of reflects too on how like. Um, like Batman, you know, like he's clearly killing people <laughs> in order to do half the things he does, <laughs> but they just like don't address all of those deaths, you know. They, yeah, they, they just can it. <laughs> yeah, and so to me, it's like that's kind of how they're bending the code. They're like, okay, well, Batman still can't kill, even though it's like 60 years later in real life and things have changed, you know, but they instead of addressing it, they just kind of like bend it, like, well, we don't show him killing all these people. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> and so I feel like Jupiter's legacy is like really <laughs> cool in the way that it's asking those questions and making me think about things beyond just Jupiter's legacy itself, you know. The, oh, yeah. the obvious comparison being Superman, but so much within the superhero genre, it just makes you think about it all a little bit different. Oh, yeah, for sure. And then uh do you watch Invincible? 
Oh my God, yes. <laughs> and then there's Invincible that kind of makes you answer like the other questions. Like, <laughs> again, yeah. you're comparing to Superman, kind of like if he was just an evil version or whatever to keep the planet weak. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that I final was... episode was so intense, man. Oh, man. Where he's holding oh, the train scene. <laughs> <laughs> Eat fresh. <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, that and like the the meme of him, like just like straight oh, punching yeah. Mark in the face. <laughs> Did you uh, see the people when, after they compared that to the Spidey 316 cover, like the McFarlane cover? I never, no, even, no. I never even put two and two together until I seen a meme of the two. And I was like, man, I wonder if Kirkham was like tribute to McFarlane <laughs> in that because it's almost the exact same scene. But Oh, nice. No, yeah. I hadn't even seen that. Well, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Was, oh, this year has been awesome for like movies and like comic movies finally we kind of went through a drought there and all stuff's finally starting to happen again like wandavision and winter soldier and yeah invincible yeah. what'd you think of uh winter soldier oh i liked it yeah uh, oh yeah oh it was all action and stuff that's what i'm doing i really <laughs> like john walker man like <laughs> he was yeah. perfect for u.s agent like yeah yeah, I really liked um, John Walker. I thought he was a great character, and it, it just like brought so much depth to like a lot of the MCU in general, but especially to like Captain America because we often think like, oh yeah, he got the super serum, and then he's like a great guy, and he is Captain America. But it's like, no, you have to understand the kind of person it takes to yeah. even like be able to handle that kind of pressure in the first place is not just anybody with super serum, you know? And so I thought this show did a great job of giving a lot more depth to the mantle of Captain America and what it takes to be that kind of person. Oh yeah. There's a lot of pressure on that guy. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> and, and I liked, uh, I, the only thing I didn't like about it is it just kind of felt like Bucky got dropped. Yeah. And, that. Like Bucky yeah. just all of a sudden he's at half power and just sort of a joke. <laughs> yeah, like they really nerfed his power level and then they like halfway through the show he kind of just like fades into the background for a while and then they bring him in at the end like, oh yeah, he uh, went and apologized to the guy or whatever. But I felt like he didn't get a great character arc, which mostly no. sucks because his name was in the title. Like <laughs> He felt like a secondary character about halfway through and I was like, eh, that's disappointing. But I it love, gave Sam's character a lot of development and room to breathe. So, yeah, I, I found myself like liking Zemo as one of the favorites at the end. <laughs> Just like, yeah. man, what happened to Bucky? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, for Zemo. <laughs> yeah, Zemo was so good. Yeah, like man, even even Disney got in on the joke. You know, like you know it's good at that point. <laughs> When the cor corporate overlords are like, yeah, we're going to like release a whole hour long cut of this three second scene. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that was cool. And I really enjoyed one division. I like, I grew up on like reruns of a lot of those shows. And so for them to kind of like pay homage to all of it, you know, it was just, it was really cool. Yeah. That, that was a show that I didn't know I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at first, it was kind of slow. I was like, but I think they're doing something. Like, I think it's leading somewhere. But by the end, it was just like, this is pretty cool, actually. Like, it's a really fun ride. And it's just, yeah. I, I, I just, yeah, I like when somebody just creates something that, yeah, I, that's, I don't know. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> yeah. Not. Yeah. I thought it was a lot of fun. It was real quirky. It was cool the way they handled everything. And uh, I thought it was cool that it gave a lot of, uh, you know, like some screen time and some character development to like these more like tertiary characters, like, uh, uh, what's his name? Randall Park, uh, that character. Is that the and agent guy? Yeah. 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 I, like I forget him. his name. And, uh, Jimmy Woo. Yeah. Jimmy Woo. <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> uh, like him and like Monica Rambeau got developed and turned into a, a powerful character, you know, and we got some of Kat Dennings in there and stuff. So like, I like the way it kind of touched on a lot of these smaller characters and that way maybe we can see them turned into more down the road. Yeah, she got a lot smarter. She got like a doctor's degree or something. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to figure that out too. I guess, I guess it's been five years though. So yeah. yeah. I always forget there was a time or uh, five year. <laughs> jump. Yeah. There's like a huge five year gap of like all this information. They're just like trying to pack in. I kind of, I don't know. It kind of annoys me. Like, 
I like time travel stories and stuff like that when it's really well done, but that's about it. Like there's no, like this was kind of okay. Time travel. Like it either <laughs> works or it doesn't for me. And I feel like the MCU's version of time travel, I'm not really into it that much. Cause you know, we had like the weird branching realities and nobody really knows anything. It seems like they made it confusing just so they can get away with anything they want to yeah, do yeah. now. I, I feel think like they're just going to spend a ton of time like trying to pack things into that little five year window. Yeah. No, I think uh, once the multiverse became an option, Marvel and DC were like, yes, we can get away with anything now. <laughs> yeah. Something stops in a different timeline. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when we see that, I'm assuming you saw the big DC Warner Brother announcement that they're pursuing a, a black Superman character. <laughs> yeah, the internet was pretty mad about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't feel like I'm as upset as other people, but it's just, like, really weird that they're, like, this is going to be a different character from a different universe. And, like, they're trying to be very careful to make sure they're not saying that we're going to see this Superman appear in like the Snyderverse stuff or something like that. You know, uh, it almost felt like they were trying to like not step on Henry Cavill's toes. Cause they haven't had that meeting yet, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I thought that was kind of annoying. Like, why wouldn't you just do something unique within the universe that you're so desperate to hold on to? Like I was saying, scrap all that stuff and start over a long time ago. <laughs> now that they finally kind of sold it, like start over. And I'm like, I don't understand what they're doing now. But, like, if that was Marvel, they wouldn't do that, right? They would just make a Steel movie and make Steel awesome. Like, yeah, Marvel's exactly. like Guardians of the Galaxy and made them good. Like, <laughs> they take these characters that I never knew I liked in any way and they make them awesome. So it's like, that's what DC needs to do, man. Like, they have characters. They're just not – they're so focused on Batman and Superman. Yeah. That they barely branch out. Like, Yeah, which makes me wonder, you know, just – thinking about it now like do you think i don't know do you think that they feel like they don't have the power and capability to do something like what marvel's done with guardians or something where they've made them popular or do you think they're just being lazy and like totally trying to lean on superman and batman over and over again i i think marvel's got that kevin fergie guy or fergie or whatever his name is kevin feige like yeah, he's like a huge, huge fan, and it totally shows. And DC, I feel like they'll hire fans to direct and make movies, but then it almost seems like the the head guys and stuff just interfere with them. They're like, oh, you should do this. This is so – like that's kind of the feeling I get from DC. And it seems like yeah. sometimes a gem will make it through where they just sort of left this person alone. But a lot of times it feels like they're just getting messed up with and stuff, or they're just – like they're not they don't have a lot of like just fans it doesn't feel like they have like solid architecture in place yeah it, marvel just feels like it's like when you go through old marvel movies and you the rewatch value and all the easter eggs that are hidden in those and you could tell it's comic fans that are making those because they've wanted to put the shit in movies for 30 years and stuff like DC doesn't feel that way. Like, I don't know why. Some of the movies are good, but they just, yeah, they don't seem like they have a plan in any way or it changes every year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, they keep announcing stuff and then we get, the, I, I mean, we had like what, the Blue Beetle and all of that stuff. I don't know how much that was announced as much as it was just like basically known information at some yeah. point. But then they like turn around and they'll have a big announcement event and it's like completely different stuff on the board than than what you've been hearing about, you know? And so it is like it feels like it changes every day anymore. Like we're going to make this movie and then the next day they cancel it, you know? Well, it's almost like they're just like hoping people bite. Like if people really get onto it, they're like, oh, yeah, we'll totally make this. And if and nobody's <laughs> interested, they're just like, all right, we're gonna, we'll mention that. Like, <laughs> what's yeah, the next we, I mean. That was complete. My, my thought on like their universe is why didn't they just start with the justice league movie and put a bunch of people there and then like let the fans react. And they're like, Oh man, like Superman was so cool or cyborg was so cool. Run with those people are literally yeah. telling you what character and what casting they liked run with that. But instead they want to do like these really awkward things <laughs> to build up to a finale in justice league where they're still introducing three new characters. Like, uh, 
do that. That was the worst. What was that? Batman versus Superman or whatever, where they had like the almost the previews of the characters in the Bat Cave. <laughs> he had like the video yeah. of the Flash. The, the Flash <laughs> emblem came up. And then he had the video of Wonder Woman. <laughs> just like, oh, this is bad. like a flash drive with just like every superhero and yeah, yeah these like promo films. <laughs> and, and they're like, we hadn't even got Justice League yet. I think we were still a Batman versus Superman. They're like. You guys are going to love Cyborg. We already have a Cyborg movie planned. You guys are going to think Flash is the coolest thing. We have a Flash uh, Flashpoint movie planned. Like, what are you doing? These are all things you have to build up to and make sure that the the market has faith in your cast choices here, you know? Yeah. Just because it's the Flash doesn't mean we're going to love him. you got to make us love him in this version, you know? Well, yeah, and I, I always thought it was funny because the CW Flash was way more popular than the movie Flash. Like, <laughs> it was just so cheesy and campy. I'm just like, man, this is what you guys are being beat by. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I, I totally am not on the Ezra Miller Flash train. People, no, he kind of he annoyed me pretty quickly. Like, he's not, so funny, but not you know. get into it. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah. Uh, so uh I guess like what kind of comics uh influence you? Why did you decide to create the Nefarious Smiths? Um I've always mostly read Spider-Man, but like I'll read Spider-Man's always been my key book, but I I like a lot of indie stuff. Uh the main reason I did the Smiths was I was just kinda I used to create comics as a kid and then I sort of got out of them for quite a few years just because I was going to school and getting a job and couldn't afford it and stuff. So uh, I forget, it was like my buddy or my wife uh, made a comment about my hobbies and I was like, I don't have hobbies, I work. And they're just like, oh, well, you should probably get a hobby. So I was like, drawing the one day. My wife's like, oh, what are you doing? It's like, oh, just drawing like I used to. She's like, oh, that's cool. And then simultaneously at the same time at work, there's this guy I work with and he's telling me about his brother-in-law and this horrible comic he made. Okay. There's a certain type of comic collector and their favorite characters are carnage, uh, punisher, Joker, uh, Deadpool, <laughs> there's a certain group of characters they like. Right. Yeah. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. That's cool. Everybody read what you like, but like I've come across these collectors. I'm sure everybody knows who they are. It's like, you know why they're reading comics like <laughs> so, so he's telling me about his brother-in-law in this comic he made and he's like yeah it's some kind of punisher carnage joker knockoff blah 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 and he's like it's so bad he's just like making jokes murdering people i'm like oh yeah <laughs> it's like i used to make comics when i was a kid and then he like brought me one in i sort of looked at it and was like whoa it was like I could make a better comic than this, I think. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, maybe that's what I'll do. I'll just make a comic for fun. And James was like, oh, okay, go ahead, man. And so, uh, like, I, I did it when I was a teenager, like, 16 years ago or something. We used to make zines and comics and stuff. So it had been quite a while. So I got on the internet, and then I got on Facebook and stuff and reached out and found an artist. I sort of started kicking some ideas around, and I had this, all these drawings of, like, family and stuff, and we just sort of started – talking about, well, what could we do that was different? We wanted it to be kind of cartoony, and we wanted it to be like an animated feel and uh, just different. So that's why we went with the villains, because we're like, well, everything's about heroes. And like heroes are kind of overdone at this point. So like when something's overdone, how do you un-overdo it? I don't know. We just... <laughs> Figure this is the best option, yeah. <laughs> and so we found a letterist and we found it was weird because none of us, like other than the artist, I hadn't really done a comic in years, and colorist hadn't really done a comic yet. And our letterist we found, he was like, Hey man, I've never lettered a comic before, but I'd sure like to try. So we're we're kind of like that group of no like group of five people didn't know what we were doing. My wife had never edited before. We're like, Yeah, come with us, we're going to make a comic, join the group. <laughs> And so, yeah, we kind of threw it all together and we just printed out like a bunch of copies just for a few friends and stuff and to give to the comic shops around town and everybody really liked it. So after that, we were just like, well, let's just keep going with it. And so it's worked out really well, actually, but it was just, it was just a whole bunch of coincidences and they all just kept leading to the next step. Like there was never a goal to make a comic or a series or any of this. It just sort of all kept happening. 
So it's kind of, I don't know, it's been weird, just a bunch of flukes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's led you down the path to make, what, three issues now? Uh, actually, this will be, we have five regular issues and a annual, and then this will be like, this is an 80-page standalone story. So this will be like the seventh one, I guess. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't even realize there was that many. <laughs> no, we're cruising. I think now. I have like, yeah, I think I have like number one and the annual. Oh, yeah, yours is the, that's the first four issues collected, though. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a collected. I didn't realize it was that many issues. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good. Like, it, it just flies by. It's a lot of fun. It's it's like all of the um, hijinks of, you know, like, whatever the, the superheroes, like, whatever they break into the base or something, you know. <laughs> like, it has all of those hijinks, but it's all from, like, the other perspective. And so, like, they're more, like, setting the traps and, and trying to defend themselves and... <laughs> It's a lot of fun. Like it, it reads real fast. It's got good like action and pacing to it. Uh, it's it's weird. It's a uh, it, like I I work at a, a slaughterhouse. <laughs> all the maintenance guys that I work with, none of them read comics, and I'll bring them in, and they're all sitting there reading it. They're just like they've actually some of them gotten into other comics because they've read the Smiths, and they're just like, yeah, man, this is kind of funny, and it's like we can relate to this a lot easier than we do a regular comic or whatever. And I'm like, I don't know what that means, but I'll take it as a compliment. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go. Well, it's uh, something I've talked about before. Like a lot of people don't have exposure to comics outside of superheroes, you know? And so whenever you bring something to the table, that's not just like your classic superhero story. Like it tends to be eye opening for people that that's what comics are. They can be the same thing that you love about Netflix or, Amazon Prime or whatever else, you know, HBO, like they do oh, these yeah. miniseries and people love that. And I feel like that's where comics are really getting footing now is that we're looking at it more from like a genre standpoint than like, yeah, exactly. what can I do new with a superhero? Like instead we're going like, let's do spy espionage stuff and we can put some superheroes in there, you know? Well, it's cool now with Kickstarter and everything. Like there's it's way easier to get a creator's work or just find new creators and lots of, and it's way easier as a creator like this print on demand now and stuff so it's like you can do smaller batches and it's way more affordable and oh there's a lot of options now it's a really awesome time to create and even to read like to find new books like and even like i know it doesn't sound good but this whole COVID thing trapping everyone in their house for a year <laughs> now you're starting to see all these books come out because this is what people were up to the last year. So it's yeah, like one nice positive out of a big negative. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I, I've <laughs> controversial opinion, but outside of the fact that people get sick and, and can potentially die from, uh, you know, a COVID infection, it, it's basically forced the rest of the world to live a little more like me. And <laughs> it's been a solid year. Like I can't <laughs> complain. Like, <laughs> I hate going to crowded places. I hate going into stores and having to like walk around people and like try to maneuver. And so for like almost a year of my life now, whenever I do go to the store, I have to wait in a line outside, but then you get in and there's nobody in there. <laughs> I go, I go and do all my grocery shopping and it just like gets done, you know? Oh, so Come to Canada, <laughs> there's nobody anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's my problem. Too far south. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Every time we go to the States, I'm like, man, there's so many people just everywhere. <laughs> well, and you live in a more rural part of uh, Canada as well, don't you? Um, I'm actually, like, where I'm from is seven hours north of where I live now. And, like, that's the middle of nowhere. I grew up in a town with, like, 2,800 people and just, like, farmland for hours in every direction. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm in a city now. It's like hundred thousand, but it's still, man. It's like farmland. As soon as you're outside the city, in every direction, so it's like, yeah. I, yeah compared to other places, it's pretty rural. <laughs> <laughs> in Canada, it's a big city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I grew up like in the in the country, like out in the rural part of Texas, and like where when I was born, there was like twelve thousand people in my hometown, you know, and. By the time I graduated and left, they were up to like 16,000. So it's awesome growth, you know, but like that, that's a small town for us, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's like a nice, nice size town here, almost city. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, uh, what is your 
what is your process for creating the nefarious myths? Because you're writing it, but then you have your wife editing. You have a, a pencil artist and a colorist and a letterer as well. So what's it like bringing that team together? Uh, not bad. I'm pretty bad writer just because, like, I don't know. It's not something I ever learned to do when I was younger. That's why it's nice to have my wife. She's all She loves grammar and editing and catching all my mistakes and telling me about them. So... <laughs> There's that. The story, the story part though, it's weird, man. Cause like, I did the first issue, and then when we decided to do a series, I almost had like an idea for like almost like fifty issues, like right off the bat. So I sort of plotted out roughly all the points I wanted to get to, and now I'm trying to do it in sort of arcs and stuff and sets. I don't know. It's really weird how far ahead you want to plot so that you can ha introduce a character way before they need to be there because that's that's important to me i hate i hate when i'm reading something and the new character is always the character who's the villain also like bruce yeah. best friend from childhood shows up oh what a coincidence he's also this <laughs> guy <laughs> so it's it's fun trying to plan all that stuff way ahead and We've, we've got like two or three artists and we kind of rotate through them depending on the type of story it is. And that way they can go and do other books at the same time so they don't get kind of desensitized to this book, clean their palette. Um, basically I'll write it out. I'm not, I'm not a super descriptive writer like Alan Moore or something. I won't give them a <laughs> two page description of a panel. <laughs> so we've been pretty fortunate with the artists. They kind of like, most of our artists have been from Mexico and stuff, so it's it, this, that's why this one takes place in Mexico. Actually, is just because you know they know it better there. Yeah. But it's sort of like a language gap. I, I don't speak Spanish, and their English is sort of broken. So we've sort of worked out really well, just with the characters and describing things. We kind of talk about. I'll talk about a scene with them more. Be like, Graceland's getting from this building to the car. So she's going to be running through the building, dodging cops. And then I'll just kind of give him the balloons and the, the talking and everything. Just leave him up to him when she's jumping out a window or jumping over something. And just be like, man, just try and make it flow as best you can. So it's, it's a pretty good creative process. We got Edgar, too. Originally, it was supposed to be like a black and white book. But Edgar, um, well, Dennis at the time was the artist. He was like, man, who's coloring this? And I had no colorist. So he was just like, ah, oh, almost disgusted with me. And that's, uh, <laughs> so there, eh? well, like, kick in the pants. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, why am I even bothering with this book? Almost <laughs> like, so that's, uh, I've tracked down Edgar cause he'd colored a cover for us previously. And I sent him the first page and he colored it. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh damn, well, this book is definitely going to be color. Like we, it can't be black and white now that I've seen it. <laughs> And it's weird because Edgar and myself have been like the two solids who have been on every, well, and the two solids who have worked on every issue together. So it's the first time I've really seen a writer colorist team up, <laughs> you should say <laughs> a writer artist or something, but yeah, yeah, he's, uh, he helps with everything, man. He knows, he always knows what kind of, like he knows so many artists from Mexico and just like his area and stuff. And every time we want to change styles for a different story, he's like, oh, I got this guy who lives down the road for me. Like, we'll give him a try. And he's just, he's been so helpful. And he'll tell me this scene doesn't work. Let's change this. And Oh, it's really cool. It's definitely been a learning process. Yeah. But, yeah. I like, uh, I like that, you know, kind of like the things that you do and don't like in storytelling, like in, in, in comics, you know, a lot of those tropey things. Um, you know, you had Tynan's Batman. He introduced this character, uh, Ghostmaker. Yeah. It's like, kind of like you described. Like, he just shows up out of nowhere. It's like, oh, yeah, remember when we were friends? Like, yeah, while you were like, training on the side of this mountain for those two weeks that we've never yeah. mentioned before in all, like, 80 years of Batman history. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> come on, man. Like, <laughs> I think I we all see what's you. about to happen here, you know. <laughs> so I love <laughs> I love that you're like thinking about that and thinking ahead and saying, like, you know, let's start planting this stuff. Cause like I never read Invincible, but that's what I hear about the show is that they haven't really changed much other than they tend to like take a lot of things that start to happen later in the series and they start kind of hinting toward them earlier yeah. on. 
And so it makes like the payoffs a lot, a lot better, you know, because they were there the whole time right under your nose, you know? Well, the best, uh, do you ever watch the spectacular Spider-Man, the cartoon? Mm, I don't think I've, Oh man, it's a treat, dude. If you've never watched that cartoon, go ahead. It's is it a so current good. one? Pardon? Is it a current one? It's a cartoon one from like, no, it's from 2010, I think. Two, it, oh, okay. it, there's, there's two seasons, but they uh, was the it all like the Disney? Bought, no, I, I think Warner Brothers actually did it. And I think the reason it got canceled was because Disney bought Marvel. Oh, okay. Halfway through the series, because it, it's got that Warner Brothers style animation to it. But yeah, the they wrote it and they set up the characters and the future stories. Like it, it's the best Spider-Man cartoon. It's so good, but yeah, it, and it just it made it so much more rewarding watching these characters. Like some of the villains, they tried so hard to be heroes prior, like an, almost an entire season or a season and a half, and just it never worked out for them. So it's almost like <laughs> when they become a villain, you're almost like, yeah, man, I get it. You try. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the things I love about um, the Ninja Turtles uh, yeah. properties, because like they they never you know like IDW their their current run they're up to like a hundred and something. And I read like the first three or four trades, and I love how like they know where everything's going, so they're like kind of seeding all that early on, you know. And that's what made the 2012 cartoon such a great series is like instead of like the original cartoon where it was just like flying by the seat of your pants, you know, <laughs> they were like, okay, we know these kinds of things are going to start coming in later. And so like the 2012 series is so great because it just like kind of goes ahead and starts to like seed all that lore that you're going to see later on. Well, it's weird. It's like TV writers somewhere between 1999 and 2010 TV writers were like, Maybe we should like connect the episodes and make stuff make sense. <laughs> and people were like, "Yeah, this is what we've always wanted from TV." Like, yeah, <laughs> you guys have the the best ability to tell stories. Like, movies are so <laughs> limited with time. Like, the proper series done right. It, like, I don't know why that took TV so long to figure that out. I tried to go back and rewatch the X Files. And as good as it is, there's a lot of freaking filler episodes in there, man. Like, <laughs> Smokey Man will be up to something, and it's 16 episodes until he's back, and there's nothing connecting those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it's like the unfortunate cycle of TV. I've always seen it as like, you know, my parents, they always talk about when they were growing up, there was like three or four channels or whatever. And even in the early days, those channels turned off, you know. <laughs> but like growing up in the mid to late nineties, um, you know, TV, there was so many channels then they were rerunning stuff all the time. And you started to get like these specialty networks. I would go to my grandma's house and we could watch, uh, just like Western reruns on like this one channel all day, you know? So like, I think that's where we started to see like, you know, TV at one point was created as like this episode, you might see it, you might not. And so we got to make sure there's no like super relevant information in any of these episodes, but also <laughs> everything needs to be relevant. Oh. And so you get like all that kind of stuff. But like, once you get into the nineties and there's so many rerun channels, they're like, well, if you miss an episode, like you might catch it on rerun or something, you know, cause they're going to show it like 12 times before the next episode drops. Oh, yeah. And uh, then like, once you move into the modern era with binging and Netflix and all that, like, that completely changed the game of oh, like yeah. connecting the stories across each episode, you know? I remember as a kid, they'd have like a two part episode and sometimes they'd play two episodes back to back. And the second episode wouldn't be the second part. <laughs> and you'd be like, Who was running this place? Like, <laughs> whenever, whenever I would get out of school, like the bus would drop us off at four 30 and it was like maybe about like a quarter of a mile down to our actual house where we lived, you know? And so the bus would drop us off at 4.30 and I would rush home and uh, I would get there at like 4.35 just as like the opening intro was ending for Batman, the animated adventures, you know? And so that's like every afternoon after school, I was rushing home to watch it. And then like the, the block right after that, they would show like Superman, the animated series. And it was like, I don't know, it was like a completely different person had control of that show every day. I was like, why? Like none of they would do like two part episodes, but from day to day, it wouldn't even be connected. You know, it'd be like a three part run. And like, they just wouldn't show the middle one. They would show a random other episode for some reason. 
That's just some adult just like messing with kids. Hey, like, wow. yeah, <laughs> like Batman the animated series. Like it was so particular. I remember that would always show every episode just like in order. But then the block right after that with Superman the animated series, it was like, who is running this show right now? <laughs> They must be paying a ton of guy for the programmer to do all the Batman stuff, and then they like cheapskate on the uh, Superman programming. <laughs> no, it's hard explaining to my kid. It's like you don't realize how cool it is having Netflix and just being able to like turn on whatever cartoon you want. Like me and my brother, we had Sunday mornings and Saturday mornings, and if you didn't get there on time, you just didn't get to see your show. <laughs> but like we planned yeah. our week around that. Like we planned our chores around that. <laughs> <laughs> no the the one that always blows my mind is um my wife she watches like uh these novellas and stuff that come on like regular antenna tv still and so she'll turn that on and it'll be on and it'll go to like commercial break and my kids are like it's an ad they're like how do you where's the skip button you don't <laughs> just wait and like skip and i'm like no, these are what we called commercials. We didn't call them ads back then. They were called commercials, and you had to watch the whole thing. <laughs> and it just, like, blows their mind that it's not an, an ad that you have to wait five seconds, and then you can hit, like, skip, you know? <laughs> oh. Oh. It's cool. It's such huh? a crazy generational divide. Yeah. I remember, like, Saturday kids. morning. What's up? They did away with cartoon blocks now. You either watch it on cable, like on Cartoon Network, where it's on whenever you want, or you watch it on Netflix and pick what you want. Yeah, oh, exactly. I don't know. I miss the – yeah. I, I don't know. I'm sort of torn on it. It's a lot awesomer, but at the same time, you don't get exposed to that random new cartoon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, what's Freakazoid? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh my god, freak sweet so good. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I hate. Um, it's kind of cool. Like Netflix recently added like that play. It's like play a video button or whatever. Oh, the shuffle thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. But yeah, I'm with you. Like it's really cool when I know what I want to watch and I can go in there and pick it and watch it and like it's it's beautiful. It's amazing, you know. But then there's also like the sense of like we just sit there and doom scroll because. We don't really know what we want to watch, but you have to pick something, you know? And so I think it's kind of cool they added a random button. Hopefully that brings that sense of discovery back into our lives because I do miss that. I watched a lot of really bad, like, B movies on just, like, regular TV in the middle of the day on Saturdays, you know? And kids don't get that anymore. Oh, yeah, exactly. Flipping through the commercial <laughs> and you just sort of put the remote down. What is this? <laughs> yeah. Why is this mountain trying to kill everything around it? What is going on here? <laughs> uh, no. That's awesome. So um, I guess what are you, you're running a Kickstarter right now to um, promote this uh, vacation issue of the Nefarious Smiths. Yep. So when's the Kickstarter running and what's kind of the parameters uh, there? Uh, we're about two weeks in right now. That was just two weeks left. Uh, it's a uh, it's for the Trouble in Tijuana special, which is an eighty page standalone. You don't need to uh, have read the other issues to pick this up either. Like we wanted to do a standalone story, sort of just like think of the Smith series as like a TV series. This would just be like a movie or a feature film that's <laughs> tied in. Uh, there's a 70 some... movie, uh, a 70 minute uh, TV movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is our Batman Mask of the Phantasm. <laughs> oh, I just watched that recently too. Gee, is it still good? Yeah, it holds up. I got to watch that again. I haven't seen that since I was a kid. And all I ever read about is how awesome it still is. And I'm like, man, I remember it being good, but that's also childhood memory. So I don't know <laughs> if I trust that or not. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about uh, Canada, but. We have HBO Max now, and so yeah. that has, like, all the Warner Brothers stuff and all that, and so it was on there. Like, all the Batman and WB stuff is there, and I was like, man, everybody talks about how good this movie still is. So <laughs> I went ahead and turned it on one Saturday, maybe, like, three or four weeks ago. I was like, man, this is still awesome. <laughs> Sweet. I'll have to check that out. Um, yeah, but anyway, there's a couple different covers. Uh, we did it as a mini series as well. Because everybody always has varying covers for their Kickstarter, and it's it'll be like eighty covers for the same book. So instead of just 
doing 80 covers for one trade paperback. We did three variants, but we made it into a mini series. So it's a bunch of yeah, smaller issues instead of the same issue, just to present it differently. Yeah. We did like a foil version. We got some original art on there. Uh, nice. Yeah, a few other things. Uh, did you get that comic machine version? Did you check that out? Like the digital no. one? Oh, uh, there's this new thing called Comic Machine. You should check it out, actually. Go to Comic oh, Machine. yeah, no, I know what you're talking about. Like yeah, it's really like comicsology, but it's sort of more animated and stuff. Yeah, um, uh, that was really cool. Yeah, okay. I went through that like the night you sent it, and then I forgot to look at it again. Oh, yeah. We did, the whole, remember it. we did the whole book that way, and every backer gets a copy of the PDF, and they also get the little digital Comic Machine animated version as well, no charge. So that's just, I don't know, I thought that was pretty cool. They did that all yeah. for us just to like kind of show off their comic machine technology. Yeah. So hopefully that kind of stuff catches on. Cause I always felt like I really like comicsology, but they just sort of, they're halfway to where they should be. And these guys mm -hmm. kind of added a little bit of animation and stuff. Like these guys still need a little, I think they could still add sounds and stuff. And there's still, there's a bit more they can add, but. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm kind of with you on Comixology because I have like the the Galaxy Note uh, 20, so it's like a giant phone, yep. and yet it's still just slightly too small to really read a comic on. Yeah. So it sucks there, and then I can read it pretty well on my computer through the Comixology website, but it's a really boring experience because you're literally just seeing like a whole page and then move to yeah. the next one, and you know. But like the thing you sent. And well, okay, there's uh, webtoons, right? Yeah. And they have like that vertical scroll. And when I do find a webtoon that actually the creator actually like takes advantage of that, yeah, you I absolutely it. love it. Like you get so sucked into that that feed, you know. I know. But, I wanted to put our book on there, but you got to have it set up a certain way, or else it's just an editing. You don't set nightmare. it up for that. Like it doesn't. It's not fun to read. But yeah, if you if you capture that that vertical scroll thing, like it's really cool. But there's this other one called Macroverse. Oh. And that's kind of like what you sent, the the robot or the comic machine or whatever. Yeah. It's sort of like that. Like they'll have like establishing shots and then like the panels will actually like swap through and stuff yeah, like cool. that. Kind of just like what you were uh, you had sent on that other one. And uh, so that's really cool. And that's the format I want to see digital comics move into yeah, because it feels fun to like move through the story like that because – different elements are moving and stuff. And like you said, if they could add in like sound effects and stuff, that'd be really cool, you know? Cause like yeah. my macroverse, you just tap the side of the screen and it like does all the motion for you, you know? So you could throw in some sound effects in that and that would be like really engaging. So that's cool technology that you're working with. That's awesome that you uh, got to sample that. I was really happy they reached out to us about that actually. Cause we only had a, like a week before we were launching and he was like, Hey man, can you offer this? And he was just like, I would love to do it, but I don't have time to convert this all. And they just helped us out with all of it so that we could offer it. So I was pretty happy. But yeah, that, that's also the route I'd really like to see digital comics take too. A lot of people who I showed it to, they're just like, this is really fun to read. They're like, I like, I prefer reading your book this way. I was just like, all right, that's good. Yeah. And these were like non-comic reader people. So mm -hmm. that's really what you like to reach out and try and grab too. Yeah. Yeah, because that's the base that, you know, we, we need that foundation. Like, you have to be bringing new people in, and you have to be reaching new people in new ways, you know. They have a different expectation than somebody that started reading comics in the 60s or the 70s or the 90s, you know, or the 2000s because of the way that type of material is presented. Oh. I know uh, my kids, they love manga, you know, and it's a – a different size format it's in black and white and it's got like this big clean paneling and stuff and it's hard to get them into comic books but i also wonder what effect that's going to have down the road because we're selling them 22 page comics and they're paying like eight dollars for these big thick novels <laughs> of manga you know so what is their expectation as readers going to be down the road it's going to be different from what we expect you know oh yeah i've, I've always kind of wondered why we don't have like the big big books like that too just with a bunch of stories marvel or dc could throw stuff like that together you'd think yeah um they've recently started putting together some anthologies and stuff that come in at like you know 30 to 60 pages and stuff and they'll have like three and four stories in there so that's really cool and then you also see 
one like the trade paperback market has really picked up and yeah. uh original graphic novels and then you have like ed brubaker and sean phillips they did that uh that pulp book and they had another one right before that where it's like an original story and it's like 80 85 pages and it's just like a one-shot story and stuff like i see the market moving in that direction a lot because that competes with manga you know if if they can do like 80 to 85 pages of story for like 10 to 12 dollars i think that's how american comics would best compete with all these like manga things because like that's a hefty little read for like eight dollars, you know. Oh yeah, no, that's decent. I I found that really interesting too. Like when I'm trying to sell our books, it's a lot easier to sell it in trade format than floppies. Like people just prefer the whole story all in one. Mm -hmm. It's weird because it's kind of. I I was always raised the other way. Like I was a collector, right? So I was like, I don't want to trade paperback. I want the original yeah. first appearance. <laughs> yeah. So like you kind of have to uh, accept that your market isn't what you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, not, not what you not want, but it's different <laughs> than what you collect. So it's like, you kind of have to adjust for that. And, but whatever, man, as long as people are digging the material and enjoying it, that's all that counts. It, I yeah. always hear why, why fight with like some people are like, Oh, I prefer digital. I prefer physical. It's like, well, well why are you just offer both? And, like, yeah. <laughs> offer it to however people want it. Like that's what matters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If uh, you know, if you're gonna get it into the hands of people, it's gonna have to be on their terms, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of cool ideas. Like, don't get me wrong, I like flipping through a 22 page comic, but I also like reading a trade. I also like reading original graphic novels. I like digital comics. I like digital yeah, comics yeah, that are doing something a little different in presentation, you know, like I want all of these things. So I'm always excited for people trying to push the boundary of how we think about them in the first place. Uh, it's a pretty cool time to be, to be around. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> it's sweet too. Cause I, I'm so torn. Um, as a kid, like comics, they weren't cool. Right. Like, I was the weird kid at school that read comics. So I'm like, I'm always debating. I'm like, I'm a better off now because I'm an adult and all these things are like cool now. And like, I get all these comic movies and everything I read as a child is basically being developed or it would be cooler to be a kid now and have all this stuff just be huge. So it's like, I don't know. I'm kind of, it's kind of cool that I saw it all as a kid before it blew up. I think mm -hmm. a lot of movies and stories come out people ask me about them. I'm like, Oh, that's the one about this. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> that story came out years ago. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's always interesting. Cause I have like, uh, you know, my son, he's 11, almost 12. And, uh, so he was born in 2008. Like he grew up with the yeah. MCU, you know, like that's a thing that's just there in his life. And I'm like, you don't understand. Like we, <laughs> we were watching cartoons and trying to put together as much as we could. And they didn't really connect stuff very well because they didn't think that people would have the chance to watch it all more than one time. And like, you know, it's just a completely different world. And for him, it's just like, why wouldn't you rather watch the movies than like read a <laughs> book about it? You know, I'm like, but you don't understand. Like, this is what we had. We didn't get like Disney pumping out series like crazy. You, the only way you got new stories was in comics. So. Oh, yeah. It's a whole different world. All I ever read about in comics when I was a kid in Wizard was like, Marvel's bankrupt. It's all burning down. <laughs> oh. Well, um, you want to let everybody know where they can find you? I know you're on Twitter uh, under ABC or AB3. Um, but I don't know if you're on Instagram or any of those other places and, uh, tell them how to uh, find the Kickstarter for sure. Yeah, we're on Instagram, uh, AB312CENT. Um, and if you want to back the Kickstarter, you can go to AB312C.com and it takes you directly to the Kickstarter page. Like I said, there's two weeks left. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much the best ways to get a hold of us. After the Kickstarter, the ab312c.com website is just going to go back to our regular website. We just switch it to the Kickstarter for trying to force people there. <laughs> <laughs> Ease of access. That's <laughs> awesome. That's a lot easier than like going, telling everybody to go to like bit.ly slash. <laughs> I know. Man. People give you such confusing addresses. They're so long. And 
I don't know if you, like on our radio stations here, sometimes it's like, oh yeah, it's findahome.com slash blah, 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 blah. It's just, <laughs> who, who is remembering that? <laughs> I have that problem. I listen to a lot of podcasts and like, I'll be like driving down the road listening and they're like, go to whatever website or something. And I'm just like, crap, like <laughs> what am I supposed to do right now? And then later I'm on Twitter, like, hey, can you like send me the link for whatever you were talking about in that episode? <laughs> Like, I don't have time to write this down right now. <laughs> yeah, it's always when you're driving or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the shower like, man, if I could just get a pen and some paper. <laughs> hey, Siri. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you, man. Like I said, I heard you on um, Cheers to Comics. That must have been years ago now, maybe a year or two ago. Yeah, and uh, he had us I think that was pretty early game. on. Oh, that was sweet to get on. I remember we first uh, first got on Brian's show. We didn't even have a full book. We had like 17 of 22 pages, and we just sent it to him. We're like, hey, Mac, you review this? <laughs> it's like half a book? Like, oh. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome, was, though. Yeah, we're like, we don't know if we should finish the other half or not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's a great guy. I uh, love his podcast. And I mean, you were one of the like member, you know, like not that I don't enjoy most of his guests, but some of them like just are instantly memorable. And I can kind of recall everything that I heard, you know. And so you were one of those like you stood out in my memory whenever I heard you on there and you were like, yeah, like it was kind of a bet gamble sort of thing. <laughs> like I was kind of told I couldn't make a comic. So I decided to make one. <laughs> I was that's like, that's amazing. <laughs> You want me to do something? Tell me I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was a blast finally getting to talk to you and uh, get to know you myself. And uh, you too, I had a lot of fun talking and I hope the most success possible for your Kickstarter so that more people start reading the nefarious myths. Cause it's a blast. Well, thank you, sir. Been a, been great being here.